Hello and welcome to part 2 of Act 3, Scene 1 from Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. It's an important chapter in Class 10 English Communicative Book. We're going to start from page number 164. It could be different in your book, but we're going to start from Antony's dialogue where he says, O mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Fare thee well. I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. Who else must be let blood? Who else is rank? If I myself, there is no hour so fit as Caesar's death hour, nor no instrument of half that worth as those your swords made rich with the most noble blood of all this world. I do beseech ye, if you bear me hard, now, whilst your purple hands do reek and smoke, fulfill your pleasure, live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die. No place will please me so, no mean of death, as here by Caesar and by you cut off the choice and master spirits of this age. So if you remember what happened uh, before this in the previous uh, recording, if you've gone through that recording, you would know certain things that I told you about uh, Caesar and uh, the impending disaster uh, that he was supposed to face. So if you remember what happened was that Calpurnia had, uh, you know, she had these four warnings. Uh, she had these four warnings and she had these kind of premonitions that Caesar is going to be killed or he's going to be murdered because she has dreamt about, she had dreamt about it uh, multiple times and she had cried out in her sleep. But, and when she shared all these, uh, you know, pains and when she shared about all these problems with Caesar, Caesar did not comply with them. And then he also sends a servant to ask the, uh, augurers that means the foretellers or predictors and uh, this servant also brings the same uh, you know he also brings the same response from these uh, priests who had predicted about his death they also said that uh, you know it's going to be a very difficult day for you if you step out of your house so it's always uh, a good idea to listen to these kind of uh, premonitions you shouldn't it's not going to you know it's not going to change. The world is not going to change in a day if you're going to listen to us and if you're going to comply with what we are requesting you to. But Caesar is Caesar. Decius Brutus enters the picture and he manipulates, he maneuvers the entire plan of action because he can see that Caesar is not going to come out of the house this day and they are going to, they will have to dispose their plan. That the plan was to, uh, they had all conspired against Caesar and they wanted to murder him. So if Caesar is not going to come into the picture, then they will have to scrap their plan altogether. But he is able to give a very convincing twist to the dream. To, he gives a very feasible and a convincing explanation to the dream that Calpurnia has had. And uh, as a result of it, Caesar, you know, he, he, Caesar feels that he will be able to overcome any uh, obstacle in his way, be it these kind of obstructions that are, that are being foretold or that are being, uh, you know, that are being shown to him through these fortune tellers so he uh, steps out and ultimately he has to see his own death he faces the face of death so we are going to start from this point when Brutus and everyone else has already killed Caesar and his body is lying in a pool of blood uh, and Mark Antony enters the picture he says oh mighty Caesar dost thou lie so low are all your conquests glories triumphs spoils shrunk to this little measure so he's absolutely heartbroken you can very well make out from this line because Antony was a very dear friend of Caesar he is absolutely heartbroken to see that his dear friend body is lying on the floor in a pool of blood he is not able to digest the fact that how could a person who is so who has had so many victories he has brought so many trophies of war shrink to this little measure that means how could something of this sort happen with somebody who has been uh, you know has been a prized possession of his own nation right and all the victories and the trophies of war that he's been able to bring to Rome, the whatever he has done for his countrymen, seems so insignificant and petty at this point of time because such a noble man has been betrayed and murdered by his own people. So how ironical um, the situation seems to be. Then he fares him well. He says, fare thee well. I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. So he talks to the conspirators and he says, I don't know what your intention was behind killing Caesar. Who else must be let blood? whose 
who else is rank if i myself there is no hour so fit as caesar's death hour nor no instrument of half that worth as those your swords made rich with the most noble blood of all this world so for him there's no better time he says that there's going to be no better time to be killed than the hour in which caesar has been killed and why does he say so because he finds him to, you know he he considers him to be the closest friend he considers him to be the most noble uh, man that has ever been born on the earth and that is why he says that this is the right moment and no sword is going to be as rich as the sword that bears the blood of caesar that bears the blood of noble caesar so i request you he gets you know so overwhelmed that he request all these people to uh, you know kill him right away to uh, you know to kill him with the same sword with the same weapon with which they had killed brutally killed caesar all right then uh, no place will please me so no mean of death as here by caesar and by you cut off the choice and master spirits of this age so he says that he was a most noble person and there is no right occasion there is no right time for me to be killed than this time when caesar had been brutally killed by you all so he says the choice and master spirits of this age who are these people he is addressing the conspirators at this point of time he is calling them the choice and master spirits because now they are going to be the ones who are going to des Uh, you know destine the future of uh, romans so he leaves it open to these people then brutus says o oh, antony beg not your death of us though now we must appear bloody and cruel you yet see you but our hands and this the bleeding business they have done our hearts you see not that means you can only brutus is here to give a very uh, defensive response to what antony is uh, you know blaming them for he says that antony beg not your death of us that means don't beg us don't request us to kill you don't beg us to kill you we don't we are not the murderers here the, you you are able to see our hands that seem to be bloody and cruel at this point of time yet you cannot see the bleeding business that they have done our hearts you see not that means for you you are uh, you are feeling disgusted at the sights of our bloodied hands but you can't see what's beneath you can't see our hearts which are full of pity for not just uh, caesar but also for rome our hearts you see not they are pitiful and pity to the general wrong of rome he wants to justify that it's because uh, it's not that they are so hideous it's not that they are so um, inhuman that they could not see the pain that caesar had gone through but there the pain of caesar was more the pain of caesar was nothing in front of the pain that rome would have gone through had caesar become had caesar uh, you know had caesar been crowned as the king of rome then things would have been very difficult so he says that their pity for rome drove their hearts it was their pity for rome that drove their hearts for uh, drove their hearts and uh, it it just washed away their pity for caesar and that is why they decided to kill him it was as i told you he has been brainwashed right he has been made to believe by cassius that he has been made to believe by cassius that caesar is going to be the most brutal of people he is never going to revoke his decisions he is somebody who is going to turn out to be a dictator and his dictatorship will one day drown us all okay he is so self centered that he will never think about the general good of rome so this these uh, kind of uh, you know these kind of statements have been so uh, carefully planted in his mind that he is convinced about killing uh, caesar he is convinced with the act of killing caesar so that is why he is trying to share the same kind of wisdom with uh, mark antony and he is trying to justify the act of murder for your part to you our swords have lead in points mark antony our arms in strength of malice and our hearts of brothers temper do receive you in do receive you in with all kind love good thoughts and reverence that means he says that our hearts are full of pity and love for uh, for uh, caesar because we consider him to be our brother and don't look at the leaden swords that means don't look at the pointed uh, pointed uh, you know po pointed uh, swords that we are holding in our hands think of us as your brothers and we are welcoming you with all respect and love uh, to the senate so they are welcoming him they want him to be a part of the senate cassius says your voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities imagine you are saying it to somebody who is such a dear friend to the person who has been killed 
right you're trying to befriend him because you fear that if he's go if he's going to go out or if he's going to you know open his mouth against these senators against these conspirators then your plan is going to be botched up so the the right thing is to convince him into being a part of him into being pally with them into being uh, into taking sides with them so what does antony say uh, cassius says cassius says that your voice is going to be heard equally okay we, your voice is going to be equally strong we are going to give a lot of weightage to what you uh, think about the honors of other people uh, while we are going to give away duties to people while we are going to appoint people your voice is going to be equally important just like anyone else's voice in the senate so antony says i doubt not of your wisdom let each man render me his bloody hand you have to understand that he is asking for the bloody senators to shake hands with him does it mean that he has already sided with these people does it mean that he has chosen his uh, sides already no it does not mean this he is only pretending to be taking sides with these conspirators because he understands the plan of action he understands that if he is going to go against them up front if he is going to be too straightforward in choosing his sides then it's going to become absolutely difficult for him to run away from this place there are chances that are, that he is going to be killed by these senators just like caesar was killed and they may just cook up any story right to convince people into believing what they are saying right here he uses his brain because he wants this issue to be highlighted because he wants the the brutal killing of caesar to be known by one and all because he wants people to avenge the death of caesar and that is why he keeps his mouth shut and he shakes hand with the senators he he makes them believe that okay i'm going to be with you gentlemen all alas what shall i say my credit now stands on such slippery ground that one of two bad ways you must consider me conceit me is consider me either a coward or a flatterer that means i don't know what to do at this point of time he is addressing the senators and he says i don't know what to do at this point of time you may think of me as a flatterer because i'm trying to uh, i'm joining hands with you because i'm trying to take sides with you or you may call me a coward because you may think that i'm scared that you may kill me or uh, you may think of me as your own enemy and that is why you may just try to you know get rid of me but i am none of these and that i did love thee caesar but there is no denial of the fact that i used to love caesar with all my heart oh it's true if then thy spirit look upon us now shall it not grieve thee dearer than thy death that means will it not make you feel more sad now he talks to the body all of a sudden while talking to the senators he also looks at the body the dead body of caesar and he says that i'm i'm sure caesar you must be your heart must be mourning at this point of time as you see your own a uh, friend your dear friend shaking hands with somebody who has killed you with these people who has who have killed you so to see thy antony making his speech shaking the bloody fingers of thy foes that means you would have been more you know it would have brought you more pain than death itself when you would have seen me shaking hands with your own murderers most noble in the presence of thy corpse and that too in the presence of your dead body Cassius says, "Mark Antony." Antony says, "Pardon me, Cassius Caius." So you know, Cassius is trying to say something. He's trying to interrupt his speech, but Antony says, "Please excuse me, Cassius Caius. I want to continue with what I wanted to say." The enemies of Caesar shall say this. Then, in a friend, it is called modesty. That means you may say that you wanted to kill him for a certain reason, but for me, he was such a good man that anyone would want to kill him for his goodness. Right? Nobody can digest so much of goodness, and that is why, being a friend, I have to say all these things. Cassius says, "I blame you not for praising Caesar so, but what compact mean you to have with us? That means I don't have any problem in you praising Caesar. You can eulogize him, uh, you, you know. You can continue to praise him for as long as you want, but you tell us what is it that you want from us now? Are you going to be taking sides with us? Are you going to settle this agreement of being with us, or will you be pricked in numbers of our friends, or shall we on and not depend on you? That means should we continue with our plans, with our own plans?" by thinking of you as a foe or you're going to become uh, or you're going to befriend us and you're going to take sides with us antony says therefore i took your hands but was indeed swayed from the point he says that was why i was shaking hands with you it's a clear indication of compliance with you people it's a clear indication of being friends with you that is why i shook hands with you so again he says that i just got diverted when i looked at the dead body of uh, caesar i just got digressed and i did not i just diverted from the point i was about to talk about but don't forget that i my loyalty is uh, lie with you 
<clears throat> friends am i with you all and love you all upon this hope that you shall give me reasons why and wherein caesar was dangerous so he says that i'm going to show my loyalty towards you i'm definitely going to take sides with you and i have already made up my mind but i still feel that you should give me certain reasons why you feel uh, caesar was dangerous why why uh, did he suddenly become so dangerous and so uh, ignominious that he had to be plucked out like a uh, thorn uh, from your on your way so brutus says our reasons are full of are so full of good regard that were you antony the son of caesar you should be satisfied he says that our reasons the reasons that have uh, compelled this move this disastrous this fatal this lethal move of killing caesar they are full of so uh, you know we have such considerate Uh, reasons we have such compelling reasons for the death of caesar that had you been the son of caesar you would have definitely uh, been satisfied with what we are saying and you too would have sided with us so antony says that's all i see can am moreover a suitor that i may produce his body to the market place and in the pulpit as becomes a friend speak in the order of his funeral so he says that i have one more request from you uh, apart from giving me uh, convincing excuses apart from satisfying me with the Uh, with my questions i would also want you to give me a chance to present his body to the pulpit right to the marketplace and in the pulpit allow me to speak as any friend would have spoken on the death ceremony of their friend okay brutus says you shall mark antony and when brutus says this cassius is slightly afraid he gets a little taken aback because he is not uh, trusting antony with his words he still has uh, a grain of doubt in his mind and he says brutus a word with you aside to brutus you know not what you do do not consent that antony speak in his funeral know you how much the people ha- may be moved by what he will utter so he says just imagine you have to be on your guard at this point of time just take precaution because i don't believe what antony is saying it saying to us at this point of time there is a possibility that he may just go there and he may just sway the audience with what he wants to say he may not take sides with us he may just betray us at that point of time and if he is given the chance to address the audience he may just brush their mind he may just brainwash them into believing that all we did was for power and not for not for reasons uh, that were for the general good of rome brutus says by your pardon i will myself into the pulpit first so that means he says that don't worry cassius i'm not going to just let him go all of a sudden so brutus says you don't feel, need to feel uh, worried don't get anxious about what antony has requested us to do i'm going to lay the ground first i'm going to take the mic first and i'm going to let people know about our reason of killing caesar what antony shall speak i will protest he speaks by leave and by permission that means we must allow him to speak he so went at this point of time for his love of caesar that he cannot control these emotions so we must allow him to speak Cassius says, "I know not what may fall. I like it not." So Cassius has his doubts intact. He does not want to trust Antony with his words, with his actions. And even though he has, uh, uh, even though Antony has, uh, you know, superficially taken sides with them, but he has his doubts um, intact. Brutus says, "Mark Antony, here, take you Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar." and say you do it by our permission else shall you not have had any hand at all about his funeral and you shall speak in the same pulpit where to i'm going after my speech is ended so after this after convincing cassius into uh, believing that antony is going to say as we tell him to uh, he goes to antony and he says that you're not going to speak anything that goes against us you're only going to speak in favor of caesar you're going to praise him we do not stop you from doing so but you're never going to speak you're not going to utter a single word against us otherwise it's going to turn against us okay and you will say that you had our permission we were so generous that you had our permission to speak about your de- departed friends on your departed friends uh, funeral and you're going to speak after i'm done with my speech antony says be it so I do desire no more. So he says, I don't want anything else from you people. I'm okay with whatever you are asking me to do. Brutus says, prepare the body then and follow us. Exeunt all but Antony. So everyone leaves, but Antony stays there, right in front of the body of Caesar. Antony says, oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. What a beautiful soliloquy is going to be. He is going to be speaking to the body of uh, 
uh, Caesar and he is also going to address the audience. So you have to understand that it's a soliloquy. Wherein he is going to, um, wherein he is going to wear his heart on his sleeves, wherein he is going to let out all his uh, repressed emotions. It's like a catharsis that he's going to undergo. So he says, "Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth." Why does he call him? Pardon me means. I'm really sorry for what I've done. And who is he talking to? He's talking to the body of Caesar. He says, thou pleasing, bleeding piece of earth. Thou means you bleeding piece of earth. Why is it a bleeding piece of earth? Because it has been rendered lifeless, right? Because the body is rendered lifeless. It's dead now and it's bleeding all uh, from all over. That I am meek and gentle with these butchers. What does it mean? He say, he asks for forgiveness he seeks apology from this uh, dead body of caesar for being meek and gentle with these butchers why are they butchers because they brutally killed caesar right it was a dis you know it's it was a clear case of deception right so he's seeking apology because he's a dear friend of caesar and he does not want to take sides with the with these conspirators but he is forced to because he understands the consequences that may befall him if he does not do so Thou art the ruins of the noblest man. That means you are the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. That means you are the ruins. That means you are the remains of the most noble man that was ever born on the earth. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood over thy wounds now do I prophesy. So he's full of anguish, he's full of pain, he's full of, so overwhelmed at this point of time that he takes an oath on his wounded body. And what does he say? Which like dumb mouth. So he says that he prophesies or he takes an oath at this point of time and he also says that woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. May sadness befall on the hand of the people who have, uh, you know, who have shed this costly blood, who have, who have killed you, who have, who have been so merciless in their killing of you now uh, he says that which like dumb mouths what are we talking about you know these wounds which which seem to be there are cuts on his body right so these wounds have they seem like dumb mouths dumb mouths means mouths which cannot speak for themselves so these wounds these uh, wounds which are rip you know which are oozing out blood they seem like dumb mouths do open their ruby lips why are they ruby because they are bloodied right so this they are going to be they're speaking for themselves but they cannot speak because they are you are dead right to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue a curse shall light upon the limbs of men domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all parts of italy so he says that my words and voice will bring about a curse on the limbs of men who have murdered you, Caesar. And these, uh, these, uh, you know, these ruby lips, that means these cuts that you have on your body, these, uh, um, you know, these brutal cuts that you've received on your body as you were murdered, they are going to be given a voice through me. I'm going to speak for these, for these atrocities that have been uh, so brutally unleashed on you. Blood and destruction shall be so in use and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quarter, quartered with the hands of war. All pity choked with custom of fell deeds and Caesar's spirit ranging for revenge with eighty by his side come hot from hell shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. That this foul deed shall smell above the earth where carrion men groaning for burial. So you have to understand what he's trying to say uh, he is trying to prophesy that this death will be avenged by the people of Rome when they'll get to know the real cause of uh, Caesar's death because ambitious is all ambition is also something that doesn't go well with everyone if you're doing pretty well in your life then there are people who will be happy about you but there will be certain other people who will always be uh, you know conspiring against you they will be they will be definitely sending all those negative energies to you and they will be doing certain things which may bring uh, harm to you so this is what has happened here also he says that when people are going to get to know about the real cause of your death when they'll get to know that you were not murdered because of the general good of rome you were murdered because you seem to you seemed like a threat to them then they are going to create havoc in rome entire at least going to shake with fear and uh, pain because people are going to avenge your death they are going to be mothers who are going to smile when they're 
when their sons are going to go and fight for you there will be uh, mass destruction there will be blood all over then people are not going to let these conspirators be at ease with themselves and that is the time when destruction is going to take over even the god of uh, the greek goddess of revenge that is ate is going to be your be by your side and it's going to bring all sorts of uh, destruction all sorts of uh, you know uh, hellish things and they are going to and everyone is going to be taking sides with you caesar so don't think that you have died a silent death don't think that you have been you've not been uh, given any sort of uh, you know you've not been given any sort of uh, justice your death is going to be justified you need this murder is going to be justified because people are going to become your mouth and i'm going to be the one who is going to mediate through these pains now we move on to the next act the forum act 3 scene 2 enter brutus and cassius and a throng of citizens citizens we will be satisfied let us be satisfied brutus says then follow me and give me audience friends first citizen says i will hear brutus speak brutus says brutus goes to the pulpit second says the noble brutus is ascended silence so you can see uh, uh, you know just read these uh, lines and you'll be able to see by the comments by these dialogues that are being spoken by the first second citizen that how uh you know what kind of an image brutus holds in the hearts of these people the image is that of a noble man image is that of an honorable man image is that of a person who knows who is trusted for what he does okay people blindfoldedly trust him for what he does and what how he does and how he, he executes things so brutus says be patient till the last that means i don't want you to speak at all just be patient till the last i'm going to speak about the reason behind killing of caesar Romans countrymen and lovers hear me for my cause and be silent and that you may hear believe me for mine hour that means believe me because you know i am honorable so he is already laying down the ground he is already letting people know that you have to you have to uh, you know trust me you have to have faith in me and you have to uh, say that i am right because i am always right right this is something i'm always morally correct i'm not going to do something which is immoral i'm not going to do something which is against the general good of rome i am carrying an image and you must hook on to that image so that whatever i've done seems justified not that i love caesar less okay i think i've missed a line here it says if then that if there be any in this uh, assembly and any dear of caesar's to him i say that brutus love to caesar was no less than his so he says that it's not like i love caesar any less he was a brother to me i loved him uh, as much as anyone else in this assembly would be if then that friend demand why brutus rose against caesar this is my answer not that i love caesar less but that i loved rome more so he wants to justify that whatever he did was to the general good of rome again and again he's been reiterating the same thing that he loves rome more he loves the general people more he loves the uh, you know he loves the people of rome more than anyone else and for them he's going to do he's going to go to any extent had you rather caesar were living and die all slaves than than caesar were dead to live okay had you rather caesar were living and die all slaves that means just imagine if caesar was alive he would have enslaved you he would have turned you into slaves that that caesar were dead to live all free men so which side would you like to take he's trying to uh, you know he's trying to ask this question from the audience he's throwing this very very uh, he's throwing this question in a very cunning manner before the audience he wants them to understand that if caesar was alive then he would have definitely turned you into his slave he was such an autocrat he was such a brutal person by heart that he would have definitely turned you into slaves one day and you would have been living the life of slaves and now that he is dead what kind of a life would you like to choose would you like to live as slaves when he was alive or would you like to live a free life life when he is dead obviously people will choose the latter as caesar loved me i weep for him as he was fortunate i rejoice at it as he was valiant that means brave i honor him but as he was ambitious i slew him is it that caesar was ambitious when somebody is ambitious you need to understand children that when somebody is ambitious they, they, that person doesn't think about others that person is always very selfish that person is always very self centered you will not worry about everyone else you will not do anything for the general good of people you will be only thinking about yourself and that's going to bring you a lot of 
uh, that's going to bring you all the limelight but was caesar actually such a person we don't know anything as of now we only know that he whatever he did it was a brilliant show of valor it was a brilliant show of uh, bravery but you're going to be you're going to be acquainted with the character of caesar as we proceed with the play and then you'll be able to feel justified with what brutus is saying or uh, whether he's saying right or whether he is not saying right so he says that there is tears for his love joy for his fortune honor for his valor and death for his ambition who is here so base that would be a bond man that means who would like to live the life of a bonded person if any speak for him have i offended who is here so rude that would not be a roman if any speak for him have i offended who is here so vile that will not love his country if any speak for him that i have offended i pause for a reply so very very cunningly he has laid the ground very smartly he has concocted a story very smartly he has been able to convince people he has you know he has actually put forth his argument and he is asking people to think whether he was wrong in any way he says that if you don't think about other people in your life then i am here i have done something wrong because i also did not think about um, caesar before killing him i th- thought about you people he says that if if you're uh, you know if you're brave then i'm going to i'm going to honor you i'm going to honor you for your bravery but that bravery should not turn into ambition because when you turn ambitious then you only become self centered and with self centered approach you never think about general good of people and for people i live and i want people to think in those lines so that they feel convinced about this murder Brutus says then none have i offended you can see that everyone has already spoken about it everyone has already said none brutus none so how beautifully he has been able to convince people into believing what he says is right and what he has done is also justified so brutus says then none have i offended i have done no more to caesar than you shall do to brutus the question of his death is enrolled in the capitol his glory not extenuated wherein he was uh, worthy nor his offences enforced for which he suffered death enter antony and others with caesar's body so it, it is at this point of time when he has already done what he had promised to do that uh, antony brings the body of caesar along with others Here comes his body mourned by Mark Antony who though he had no hand in his death that means he wants to make it a point to let people know that he was not involved in this conspiracy because uh, he did not know anything about this sort and uh, he shall benefit the he shall receive the benefit of his dying a place in the commonwealth as which of you shall not with this i depart that i slew my best lover for the good of rome i have the best dagger for my i have the same dagger for myself which when it shall please my country to need my death so he is very very cunning very cunning he wants to prove himself as uh, somebody who is morally uh, upright he is uh, car- living a life uh, with utmost dignity and rectitude and that whatever he has done uh, whatever he has done is justified on moral grounds and if people think that he has done anything unjustified that he carries the same dagger with which he had killed caesar and they are free to kill him too Caesar say live Brutus live live first citizen says bring him with triumph home unto his house second says give him a statue with his ancestors third citizen says let him be Caesar fourth says Caesar's better parts shall be crowned in Brutus so you can see that uh, how uh, people are interpreting the entire scenario it's it's if you you know this this entire scene and this entire play is relevant in today's times as well if you try to compare it with what we know as general public with these people then you will be convinced in saying the same things we don't know what reality is we don't know what truth is it is always projected before us through media through government through different uh, bodies that are trying to function you know as uh, as pioneers of truth so you can see that they are the ones who are bringing truth they are twisting it according to their own whims and fancies they are letting us know things and then we own uh, we for you know we form our own judgments on the basis of uh, we form our own judgments on the basis of um, these kind of things that are put before us so here also these people don't know about the entire thing they don't know what cassius plan was they don't know that they were actually instigated to kill caesar they don't know that cassius was the actually uh, you know he was the uh he was uh, the one who carried the bone of uh, contention he was the one who had uh, 
you know, who had hatched this entire plan of killing Caesar because he did not like Caesar at all. He hated him so much that he wanted to project a negative image of him before everyone else, right? So they are blinded to this truth. And whatever has been projected to him, they've been, they've been, they've taken it because it's coming from somebody who is supposed to be the honorable person. And you can't do anything but trust that person. So Brutus says, my countrymen, second Caesarin says, please, silence, Brutus speaks, please, ho, oh, good countrymen, let me depart alone, and for my sake, stay here with Antony, do grace to Caesar's corpse and grace his speech, tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make, I do entreat you, not a man depart, save I alone, till Antony have spoke, you can, you can clearly see how um, Brutus wants people to know, and he wants Antony to know as well that he is allowing him, he's doing him a favor by allowing him to speak in the pulpit, by addressing the audience, right? He is doing him a favor. So what does he say here? He says that he has been given our permission. We've been so kind and generous that we've given him the permission to speak, right? And he is going to grace Caesar's corpse. He's going to be given an, a place in the commonwealth. He's going to also have a hand. Uh, he's also going to be given a voice uh, while, uh, you know, selection of uh, people is going to be done. And at this point of time, I don't want you to leave, right? None of you is going to leave except me. And I'm going to wait till the speech gets done. Okay. So first citizen says, stay ho and let us hear Mark Antony. Let him go up into the public chair. We'll hear him. Noble Antony, go up. Antony says, for Brutus' sake, I'm beholding to you. That means I'm speaking to you because of Brutus' sake. He goes to the pulpit and the fourth citizen says, what does he say of Brutus? He says, for Brutus' sake, he finds himself beholding to us all. It were best if he speak no harm of Brutus here. This Caesar was a tyrant. So you can see how their, uh, their, their mind has been... Uh, you know, it has been manipulated, it has been how things have been, how opinions have been maneuvered, how they've been uh, dished into their mind, how they've been inserted and injected into believing whatever Brutus is saying is right. And if anyone goes against Brutus, or if anyone tries to speak against Brutus, be it Antony only, then also he's going to be penalized for what he's doing. Then Antony comes forth and says, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. He says, I've come here to bury Caesar, not to praise him. I don't want him to be praised. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. That means, if you've done anything wrong, then it's going to stay with you even after you die. But good does not need to be justified. If you've been virtuous all your life, if you've been good to others, if you've done everything that is morally upright, then it's not going to be, it does not need any sort of justification. It's going to be with you even after you, uh, even if, even after your death. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus had told you Caesar was ambitious. So he says, he starts off by saying that I know what noble Brutus has talked about. I know what he said about Caesar. I know that he said that Brutus is, uh, you know, Brutus was, uh, Caesar was killed because he was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault. He starts off in a very convincing manner. He starts off uh, in a, in the most applicable uh, manner. But now he has started to become sarcastic. He has started adding a pinch of salt to what he's saying. He says that just because Brutus asked you to believe that Caesar was ambitious and that he had to be killed, otherwise you would have turned into bonded laborers or you would have turned into slaves, you have believed him. But I feel that it's a grievous fault, and grievously had Caesar answered it. Here, on the leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, and so they are all, all honorable men, come I speak in Caesar's funeral. Just because of these honorable men, just because of these people who stand before you as the honorable, as the, you know, uh, moral police of Rome, I am standing here with their permission. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honorable man. No matter what he says, he may be saying the truth, he may be saying the lie, he may be saying anything to twist your mind, to manipulate your mind, to make you feel treated. But you have to trust him because he is an honorable man. Everything he is going to end with this statement. How honorable he is, it is for you to think. 
he had brought many captives home to Rome. Who are these captives? People who are trying to uh, cause damage to the country, right? They are the ones who are actually the foes of country. And Caesar was the one who had valorously brought these captives to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. That means because they had to be released, so the general coffers were also filled. So he did not just bring the foes to Rome, he also uh, brought a lot of uh, wealth and prosperity to uh, Rome. He did not keep that money with himself. He kept it to the for the well-being of people. He kept it in the general coffers, wherein that money could be used for the general good of Rome. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? I mean, was it ambitious of him to do so many things for Rome, to bring money, to bring people who are going against you? Was this ambitious in uh, Caesar? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. When poor cry, that means when poor people used to cry, when people used to cry of pain, he would empathize with them. And when you have empathy in your heart, you cannot be ambitious. Because if you're ambitious, you just chuck out, you just scrap everyone's feelings, you just trod on them, you just you know, trod on them and you treat everything and everyone mercilessly, right? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. Yet Brutus, yet Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the lapical, I thrice presented him a kingly crown. So you can see the feast of God uh, Lapicus, that's a fertility god. On the occasion, I presented the crown thrice to him, but he refused it. Was this ambition? Yet, Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disapprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beats. And men have lost their reason. Bear with me, my heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it came back to me. So you can see that he says, you all had loved him for what he did for you. Then what made you become so blinded by what has been presented to you? Why can't you see the reality? Oh, judgment. Now he is trying to, uh, you know, call out to the heavens, and he is... Uh, He's requesting them to become, you know, judgment here becomes personified, right? So he's, uh, he's calling out to the gods to help him, under, uh, help him do what he has come here to achieve. And now first citizen says, me thinks there is much reason in his saying. So now the first citizen is like, we should not be blindly trusting what Brutus has presented to us. We must try to listen to the other side of the story as well. If you consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Third citizen, has he? Masters, I fear there will be a worse come in his way. Fourth citizen, marked he his words, he would not take the crown. Therefore, it's certain he was not ambitious. So all of them are talking uh, amongst themselves and they are also discussing what Antony is trying to say. And it's very important for us to understand what these people are saying because it's going to let us know that these people are not going to be easily swayed. They are going to see the other side of the picture as well and they are going to justly come out with uh, with their uh, opinion about Caesar being ambitious or non-ambitious. So the first citizen says, if it be found so, some will dear abide it. Poor soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. Now mark him, he begins again to speak. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Antony again begins to speak after these people um, have, uh, you know, silenced. So Antony says, but yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Stood against the world means it uh, definitely, the, whatever he said, he might it might have gone, it might not have gone well with, it might not have gone down well with many people. And now lies he where? And none so poor do him reverence. So masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus strong and Cassius strong. Who you all know are no honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you. Then I will wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. He says I'm not going to be unjust to Caesar who has been assassinated by calling him ambitious. But I'm going to do wrong to these people who apparently are calling themselves the most honorable of men. 
right now i'm going to open a parchment with the seal of caesar here and i'm going to let you people know what he has done and how his uh, generosity how his love how his uh, moral rectitude how his upright life has been presented to you how it has been polluted and how it has been dished out to you so that you believe what they are saying is right and you do not ever get to know the secret but i'm going to let the cat out of the bag so he says i found it in his closet it is his will but let the commons hear this testament which pardon me i do not mean to read and they would go and kiss dead caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood yeah beg a hero of him for memory and dying mention it within their wills bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue so you can see he's saying that once i'm going to read this will which i found in his coffin which i found in it not in his coffin sorry which i found in his closet you are going to literally bemoan the death of this noble person that has passed away you are going to bemoan the death of this person you will you will be filled with so much of pain that you're going to soak your napkins in the blood in the noble blood of caesar and you're going to uh, you're going to live your life bemoaning the fact that lamenting the fact that uh, caesar is no more to become your guardian and everyone starts to shout that they would like to hear the will antony says have patience gentle friends i must not read it it is not meet you know how caesar loved you that means it is not proper it's not something that i should be revealing you or it should not be something that i should be telling you about you know because i have been told to speak about uh, you know just like you speak on the death ceremony of somebody you are not wood you are not stones but men and being men hearing the will of caesar it will inflame you it will make you mad it's good you know that you are his heirs for if you should oh what would come of it just imagine he says that i know you're not you're not uh, in, you know you're not emotionless at this point of time you're not wood you're not stones that means you're not emotionless you're not immovable when you're going to get to know the truth when the truth is going to be out then you're going to feel so inflamed you're going to be so um, you know you're going to be instigated into you're going to be inflamed you're going to be instigated you're going to get mad you're going to get uh, you know you're going to get out of your control because you will get to know certain things which were not told to you in advance and this thing is going to make you feel sorry about taking sides with brutus and all the people who killed caesar okay so this is something that i would like to talk about read the will we'll hear it antony you shall read us the will caesar's will will you be patient will you stay a while i have overshot myself to tell you of it i fear i wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed caesar i do fear it there were traitors honorable men the will all testament so everyone begins to speak that we would like to hear the testament what is there in the testament that is uh, that's been hidden from our eyes what is it that you know what is it that we should have got we should have known before uh, before uh, brutus talked about uh, the murder what is it that was kept from us and how are we the heirs of uh, this inheritance that caesar has left behind you will compel me then to read the will then make a ring about the corpse of caesar and let me show you him that made the will shall i descend and will you give me leave citizen says come down descend you have our leave antony says if you have tears prepared to shed them now you all do know this mantle i remember the first time ever caesar put it on it was a summer's evening in his tent that day he overcame the nerve i look in the place ran cassius's dagger through so he you know he asked all of them to make a circle around to make a uh you know to make a circle around uh, the corpse of caesar to make a ring around the corpse of caesar and very very sensitively he is trying to draw these people into into what torture what atrocity is caesar had gone through he shows them each and every wound that his body has borne as a result of him being ambitious right so he says look in this place ran cassius's dagger though and what a rent the envious casca has made envious casca you can see that he was a jealous person and that is why he was involved in this conspiracy through this the well beloved brutus stabbed so he is showing all the wounds that caesar's body has suffered that caesar's body had faced right the daggers that have 
literally wrecked his bot that has literally ripped it from uh, from inside and how Brutus had stabbed him, how Casca and Cassius have stabbed him as he plucked his curse steel away. Curse steel is transferred epithet, you know, he has pulled his uh, uh, sword out. Mark how the blood of Caesar followed it as rushing out of doors to be resolved. How brutally he was killed. So many daggers have been, you know, uh, just put into his body and they've been, uh, the blood has been pouring out mercilessly. If Brutus so unkindly knocked or no, for Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all, and when noble Caesar saw him stab. So he's saying that Brutus used to love him, and Caesar was the beloved of Brutus, but when he killed him, he was not able to take this shock, and that is why he died of... Uh, he died of uh, disbelief, he died of mistrust, he died of deception and that stab was the most grave, uh, you know, stab that he had ever received. Ingratitude, more strong than the traitor's arm, quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart and in his mantle muffling up his face even at the base of Pompey's statue which all the while ran blood, great Caesars fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen, then I and you and all of us fell down. While thirst blood, bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops, kind souls, what you weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded. Look you here, here is myself marred as you see with traitors. So see how he has been killed, how brutally he has been murdered, how so many slashes appear on his body, how many dents have been given to his body and how mercilessly he has been killed um, for being ambitious, which he actually was not. O oh, piteous spectacle, O oh, noble Caesar, O oh, woeful day, O oh, traitors, villains, O oh, most bloody side. Remember, this takes us back to this takes us back to Calpurnia's dream. She had seen that uh, lusty Romans were washing their hands in um, in Caesar's blood, right? And who were the lusty Romans? The assassinators, right? The people who had conspired against him. They were the ones who were very happy about the fact they were delighted after killing Caesar. But now the twist that was given to the same story, the same dream uh, by Decius Brutus was that people are going to they are going to satisfy their urges. They are going to uh, treat this blood that is oozing out from different spouts on the body as noble blood. They are going to quench their thirst with it. They are going to seek inspiration and you are going to become an epitome of sacrifice for all of them, right? So here also the same thing is going to happen. When people will get to know the real cause of uh, uh, his death, his assassination, they will not let these conspirators rest in peace. They will definitely cause havoc and they are going to avenge Caesar's death by dipping their napkins in his noble blood and they will they will raise his uh, you know they will raise the, the stature of Caesar to noble heights we will be revenged revenge about seek burn fire kill slay let not a traitor live Antony says stay countrymen Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. I'm not here to tempt you into believing what I'm saying. I'm not here to uh, instigate you. I'm not here to, you know, uh, pump you up. That they have done this deed are honorable. You just have to remember that those are honorable men, as you just said, as they've made you believe. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not. I don't know whether they are feeling guilty about killing Caesar or not, but they all say that they used to love Caesar. If this is love, then... I don't know what love means in actuality and will not no doubt with reason answer you. I come not friends to steal away our hearts. I'm no orator as Brutus is, but as you all know me, a plain blunt man. I'm not here. I'm not somebody who is a demagogue. I'm not here who is going to speak convincingly like Brutus. I don't have those oratory skills with me. I'm a plain man. I'm a, I'm a simple person who speaks my heart out. And I'm going to let you know that I loved my friend and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither weight nor words nor word, action nor rut not the power of speech to stir men's blood I'm not here to instigate you I'm not here to pump you I'm not here to make you uh, to egg you on or to you know uh, to to boil your blood about things which are wrong which are dishonest I'm here to tell you just the truth and I don't have these qualities like Brutus 
I am here to show you the sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. And uh, there were, okay, but were I Brutus and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony who would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to uh, rise and mutiny. That means if I was as blessed, you know, if I had the gab, you know, gift of gab, what is the gift of gab? A gift of gab is uh, the ability to be able to speak in such a convincing manner that people are moved by your words. So if I had the gift of gab, I would have definitely, uh, you know, risen you up. I would have uh, instigated you to be able to take uh, revenge on Caesar's part. We'll mutiny, first citizen says. We'll burn the house of Brutus. Away then, seek, seek the conspirators. Yet hear me, countrymen, hear me speak. Peace, here, Antony, most noble Antony. Why, friends, you go to know what you not know. Wherein had Caesar thus deserved your loves? Alas, you know not, I must you. I must tell you then. You all have forgotten the will I told you of. So he says that don't go, don't get drifted by what I'm saying. Just listen to the to, to the words of the will and then your blood is going to boil. Then you're going to see that the love that, you, that Caesar is receiving after his death was the love that he would have deserved before he died. Here is the will and under Caesar's will to every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, 75 drachmas. So he has left a lot of money for, you know, these are silver coins that he has left for each Roman uh, citizen. And he also says, hear me with patience. Moreover, he had left you all his works, his private arbors and new planted orchards. On this side, Tiber, he had left them, you and to your heirs forever, common pleasures to walk abroad, recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. Where comes such another? So he has left everything that he, you thought he created for himself, the orchards, the planters, the common pleasures, the works, the achievements, and everything that he has built around, the infrastructural facilities, the infrastructural development that you see around, everything has been left to your uh, disposal. So do you call such a person ambitious? I don't know how to convince you people. I'm just a common man who is trying to make you understand and m trying to make you see the real side of the picture, the actual and the honest side of the picture. First citizen says, never, never, come away, away. We'll burn his body in the holy place and with the brands, fire the traitor's house. Take up the body, go fetch fire, plug down benches, plug down forms. So you can see that mutiny has already broken up. They have already waged a war against these conspirators because he has been able to instigate, because Antony has been able to instigate them up to revenge. And then you can see that he sits with Octavius Caesar, who is G Julius Caesar's uh, nephew, and he coldly calculating how to purge any future threat, how he's going to, um, you know, alleviate any future threat that may that may come in his way. Then Brutus and Cassius fall apart as the idealist in. Uh, Brutus is outraged by Crassius's practicality. So Brutus realizes his mistake. He understands that he was brainwashed. He understands that his idealism is no longer uh, standing upright in front of uh, Cassius's practicality. And the armies of Octavius Caesar and Antony clash with those of Brutus and Cassius at Philippi and Sardis. And Brutus and Cassius are defeated and both commit suicide. So this is the end of the Play. We see that both of them, he is able to avenge the death of Caesar and this beautiful chapter, this beautiful play uh, comes to the comes to an end with the death of, uh, with the suicide of uh, both the conspirators that were involved in the uh, killing of Caesar. So if you have any doubts children, you can put them in the comment section and uh, I hope this video made sense to you. All the best.